Hey, fellow Utahns. Ty Burrell here. I may be Oregonian by birth, but I'm all about Utah nowadays, especially when it comes to natural history and science. Did you know our Natural History Museum of Utah has the largest display of horned dinosaurs in the world? It's basically the visitor center from Jurassic Park minus the screaming. As a curious kid, some say prodigy, I've always had this dream of becoming a scientist. When I heard behind the scenes that the Natural History Museum of Utah was canceled this year, I was crushed. But after I put in a call with my pal Jason at the museum, he agreed to take us through virtually in a robot. I'm so excited to take us behind the scenes and share science with you. I'm not saying I'll come out of it having discovered the sixth dimension, but stand by. Okay, people, let's get curious. What's cracking, Jason? Not much. Your vertebrae. Well, someone knows what we're going to be seeing today. The vertebrates collection. Sorry, I got too excited. Let's let's head in. Oh my goodness, what happened to their eyes? Jason, I've done some very scientific research on this and I've found that stuffed animals are 100% less creepy when they have eyes. Love this guy's wings though. This is a red shafted northern flicker. Our preservation team takes out the eyes when they preserve the animals, not like taxidermy when they're posed and they add glass eyes. Who needs eyeballs? You look great, buddy. Whoa! Who, who did these belong to? This is a bear, this is a wolf, and here's a beaver. You can see on this bear skull, they have these massive sagittal crests for some muscle attachment. It gives them a really powerful bite, and you can see the same in cats and dogs. You know what? That's also how I choose my pets, Jason. The bigger the crest, the more love in my chest. Oh, how about this beaver skull? And those teeth, it looks like a giant rat. Yes, that's because beavers and rats are related. They're both in the order Rodentia. You're really thinking like a scientist. Jason, you don't have to humor me. Wow, these skulls have preserved really well. Yeah, hard bones preserve really well. To preserve soft tissues, we use ethyl alcohol. Oh, I, I know, I've been using it for years. I'm actually in my early 80s. We have a whole wet room full of preserved vertebrates. For example, this here. For each turtle kept this way, we keep just the limb and a head. Why just the head? Be straight with me, Jason. Was there a tiny turtle revolution against this guy? And did his tiny turtle followers build a tiny turtle guillotine, which would be very disturbing, but also kind of cute? <laughs> we keep the rest of the bodies in the dry collection. Now, one last thing. This is from the southern right whale, which is a baleen whale and they use this bristly part to filter and eat krill and plankton in the ocean. That is huge! Now the biggest known baleen whale is the blue whale. It's so big that you could drive a Volkswagen bug right through its aorta. You could, but you really shouldn't. Now this is from the smallest known mammal, the shrew. Some species weigh a gram, but it eats twice its body weight in insects every single day. In fact, if it doesn't eat every five hours, it's gonna die. Someone's a drama queen! <laughs> or or just, just trying to survive. To explore more about our vertebrate collection and research, we set up a socially distanced interview with NHMU's Katrina Dierig and Dr. Eric Rickard. A huge thanks to Ty Burrell for helping us all stay curious during this very unusual time. Thanks, Ty. Behind the scenes is usually your chance to come into the museum, meet our scientists, and explore the collections and research areas here at our home, the Rio Tinto Center. This year, of course, it's not possible, but we're psyched to have you join us for this one-of-a-kind virtual behind-the-scenes event. Our guests today are the curator of vertebrates, Dr. Eric Rickert, and the collections manager of vertebrates, Katrina Dierig. Remember that you'll have a chance to ask your questions live in a Q&A session right after our conversation. Eric, let's start with you. You're the curator of vertebrates and also a research scientist. Can you tell me about the collections that we're in right now? Certainly. Well, the room that we're in house all of the biological collections, uh, the so-called dry collections, but the parts that I'm responsible for, the vertebrate collections, and we actually have three of them. A collection of mammals, about 44,000, 45,000 mammals, and uh, collections of reptiles and amphibians, which we call herpetiles, they're, they're grouped together. Um, in the, in the subdiscipline of herpetology. Um, we have something over 22,000 of those and about the same number of birds. So those are the three collection groups that we have represented here at the museum. And the collections, are they significant for the Intermountain West or are they significant for the regions beyond? Principally the Intermountain West. 
We do have collections that take us around the globe. Uh, in particular, the herpetology collection has um, very fine uh, uh, collection, sub-collections of turtles from South America, from Central America, and particularly from the Australian region. And what's the time range that represented here in the collection? Some of our oldest specimens go back to the late 19th century. We have collections from the 1880s, a few earlier ones that are exchange specimens from, from old specimens from other museums. Um, and of course, right up to the present day. Now you're a mammologist yourself. Can you tell me a little bit about your research? My research is in generally has two venues, I guess you would call them. I work here in the Intermountain West and I also work in the Philippine Islands. Doing similar things, field work in areas that have been poorly represented or poorly studied in the past, particularly in the Philippines, that's the case. And even here in Utah, going to places where people have done little work um, in Utah and the surrounding states. And also uh, doing what we call resurveys of um, doing field collections in areas where previous scientists worked 50 to 100 years in the past. And that's valuable for understanding changes in community structure over time. So all that information about how biodiversity changes with time are documented here in collections like this? Yes, in our collections and in collections around the world, museum collections, natural history museum collections, uh, are really the repositories of the world's biological diversity. Both the specimens themselves and the data that's associated with them, field notes, photographs, things of that sort. Um, I try, to, I try to emphasize to people who ask why we have to have so many specimens, I tell them that each individual specimen is unique. It's as unique as an individual person. And they are the, museum specimens are the, are the factual evidence that a particular species of animal or plant occurred at a particular place and at a particular time. And just because it may have been in one place at one time doesn't necessarily mean it's there now. So everything is constantly changing and we're in a period of time now where things are, are changing very, very rapidly. So it behooves us to continue to collect, particularly in areas that we think are, are maybe critical habitat and, and have the physical evidence and the specimens that can be used in a whole variety of research later on. I'd like to talk about your mammal survey work in the Philippines. Can you tell me about that? Over the course of more than 20 years, um, me and, and, and colleagues of mine, both Filipinos and Americans, have been working around the archipelago, the Philippine archipelago. I should say one thing that's really cool about the Philippines is that they're a series of oceanic islands. With a, only a couple of exceptions, they developed out of the ocean uh, without any dry land connection to, to greater Asia. And that means that anything that's gotten there, animal, plant, insect, mammal, um, has had to cross water barriers. And the successful colonizing animals have led to an incredible diversity because these islands are also very old. Some of them are, some of them are young. So the diversity has developed over the course of millions of years and Oftentimes, at least for mammals, from only a few successful colonizing groups. So we understand very much about the evolutionary history and the diversification of, of these animals. And it's, it's, really, it's really remarkable. This is one of the reasons why islands have always been of interest to scientists, going all the way back to Darwin and Wallace in the early days of understanding uh, the process of evolution. So these colonizations into the Philippines, you said, had to come over water. Do you know from your work where those colonists came from? They came from mainland Asia, um, but in many cases, uh, well, the more recent arrivals, usually we can, we can tie them back to a living group in, in mainland Asia. But some of the other ones, arrived so early that their relatives on the, on the, on the mainland have, have probably disappeared. So it's more difficult, they root at some point in a broader taxonomy of, of the group that we're talking about, but um, it's, it's hard to tell. This is, 
the interesting things about islands is, is that they, because of their isolation, they're hard to get to. The things that can develop there develop in isolation. And, um, and the history is not written over the way it is in a continent where you have arrivals coming from other areas and moving in. So a fauna that's developed in one place that is unique to that area and, and we, can, we can unravel the history of this group and understand aspects of speciation and extinction that are much more difficult to understand in a continental fauna. So the most extreme example that I can think of of an animal that is, can tolerate disturbance and is resilient in response to, to recovery from, from disturbance is an animal uh, called the Pinatubo forest mouse. Apomys sacobianus is its uh, scientific name. It was named based on a single specimen that was collected in the, in the 1950s on the slopes of Mount Pinatubo. There had been very little work done by biologists on the mountain, or by mammalogists anyway, very few early legacy mammal specimens, but that was one of them, and it was obviously unique. Um, Mount Pinatubo blew its top in, I think it was 1991, I'm not very good with dates, but um, 20 years after the mountain went, went ballistic, um, our group, uh, had a survey, actually it was a t on, over the course of two years uh, on the mountain, and did the first systematic survey of mammals on the mountain. And the place had been devastated. Um, all of the forest was, was essentially decimated from the top of the mountain. And the habitat that was on the forest, uh, on the mountain, uh, was early successional forest the kind of place where native mammals throughout most of Luzon Island wouldn't be present. It would only be non-native rats. Um, but lo and behold, <laughs> native species dominated these communities. And one species in particular was most abundant in all of these habitats, and that was the Apomisa cobianus. We thought before we started that survey that there was a good possibility that that animal might have been extinct. And what we had forgotten, what we had ignored, even though the Mount Pinatubo eruption was classified as the second most powerful volcanic eruption of the 20th century, it was trivial. The geological evidence shows that it was trivial compared to previous eruptions of that mountain. So these animals have, have evolved in the face of these catastrophic disturbances that occur at regular intervals, and they're able to tolerate that. So that kind of an island faunal survey is really fascinating. But I know that you're also doing biodiversity surveys here in Utah, but they're a little different, right? Can you tell me about that? They are. The surveys that we're doing here in Utah are what we call re-surveys. Um, we're going to places where museum scientists worked 50 to 100 years ago and uh, going back and using new techniques, but also continuing in the spirit and in the methodology that people used in the early days, making new collections. And uh, we, so we can compare both at the level of an individual species, how their distribution may be changing, for instance, on a mountainside, moving upslope as things are getting warmer, uh, or downslope in some cases when things are getting more arid. Uh, for certain species. And we can also look at the changes in the structure of, of the mammal communities in response to changes in the vegetation structure, changes in the communities, uh, the plant communities that are there. And we've seen some, some really striking differences. Many of them seem to be driven by, by climate change, which is forcing changes in, in the, um, in the plant communities and the mammals follow that. Others are changes that have occurred as human land use uh, on the landscape have, have changed. And sometimes these are working to counterbalance each other. Um, for instance, some of the early surveys were done in, in the early decades of the 20th century 
um, or the late, late 19th century, um, when there were no controls over, over livestock grazing. And, and um, that was having a severe impact on, on plant and animal communities. And since that time, um, there have been more string, stringent regulation of grazing. We still talk about overgrazing in parts of the public lands of, in parts of the West, but um, it's nothing like it was in the early days. So there's been a lot of recovery that we see in, in the land as well and in the mammal communities. So is it fair to say that you are illuminating the natural world and the place of humans in it by looking at historical and current patterns in mammal populations to see how they've been uh, responding to changes in the environment, whether natural or human mediated. Yes, yeah, so that would be that would be generally it. The the study of disturbance and and disturbance ecology is what I like to call it. I don't know if I, I don't think I coined that term, but um, is is very important because our our world is full of very disturbed habitat and very little pristine habitat, but um, the world can heal itself if we give it time. And it's, it's encouraging to find that, that there are species that are able to persist in these places. And these are, these are things that, you know, there are only so many people who are interested in mice and bugs and things of that sort. But um, those of us who are interested in those things realize how the study of nature is, um, illuminates things about ourselves and fulfills something that is really basic in terms of the curiosity that everybody has innately, uh, certainly when they're young. And some of us in that respect never grow up. Katrina, let's turn to you. Can you tell me what your daily activities here are as the collections manager of the Vertebrate Collections? Yeah, absolutely. So my primary role as collections manager is to care for the vertebrate collections here, to care for the specimens and make sure that they are in really good shape and accessible via databases online so that researchers can search our collections and find specimens that they would want to use for their own research. The other kind of part of, of my job as the collections manager is to grow the collections. So um, that can involve going out in the field and collecting specimens, taking data, preparing them, um, cataloging them, and then installing them here in this very room, for example, um, and as well as using these specimens that maybe I've caught or have already been in this collection for my own research. So can you tell me who uses these collections? Yeah, so uh, we primarily think of these collections as being used by researchers. So that could be um, a professor, a faculty member at a university, and maybe their graduate students. Um, but the collections have a lot of different uses. A lot of artists like to use these collections as well, which is something that we don't commonly think of in museums. So sometimes we have artists come in and take photographs, or maybe use skulls or um, skins to sketch or do paintings. Um, so there are a lot of different uses. Katrina, can you tell me what it's like to prep a mammal specimen? Yeah, so I actually have some great examples here. So this is a traditional mammal study skin. And so this is the skin of the animal with the skeleton removed and all of the internal organs. Um, and so you skin, skin the animal and then stuff it with cotton and put wires in the tail and the feet and then you dry it out. And then you have um, this specimen that uh, resembles the animal in, in its um, in its form, I don't know about that. <laughs> um, <laughs> and you take all kinds of data and write it on a tag. And that's, that's the most important part of the specimen here is all of the associated data from when this animal was caught, where it's from, um, its measurements, reproductive information, things like that. And you also take, in, in addition to the skins and the skeletons, you take some genetic samples as well? Yes, so um, when we take out the internal organs, we may subsample tissue such as liver or kidney, and you can um, extract DNA to do different experiments with the DNA, or you can um, look at diseases. And so specimens like these, and the tissues especially, become really important when um, doing disease work, such as tracking a pandemic. I know that many people wonder why we have so many specimens. Is it, why is it not enough to just have one specimen of any given species? So as, as Eric had touched on um, previously, there, um, 
one specimen is a representative of a population, just like a population of people, just like um, you know anyone here in Utah, if you grab them off the street, they're a unique person. And so it's the same thing with animals. And so you may think that it's not important to have a lot of really common species, but every specimen tells a completely different story about um, how this animal has lived its life, how populations may be changing or moving, things like that. Katrina, you said that other scientists use these collections for their research, but I know that you're a researcher as well. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, so I uh, focus on a group of rodents, wood rats, and I use those uh, tissue samples that I mentioned previously to um, extract DNA and look at the genetics of different populations. And so that's particularly useful because you can track where different populations came from and where they may have moved throughout time as climate has changed. So there are multiple species of wood rats um, across the Southwest, which is the region that I focus on. And, um, and they have moved throughout different habitats as the habitat has changed through time. And um, that becomes particularly interesting when we're faced with modern day climate change. And if we know how populations may have moved in the past, that kind of gives us an idea of how things could move in the future. Katrina, you're new here to the museum. Can you tell me what the coolest thing that you found here in the collection so far has been? I guess I would probably have to say um, what, what really impresses me is the great time series of specimens that we have because of some of the resurvey work that Eric talked about. So we have you know, these really fantastic slices of time where we can look at one species from one area. And, and maybe you know, when there was a survey one year, that species wasn't there. And so just being able to pull out a drawer um, of one species and look at, at all of them throughout time, I think is really fascinating. Eric and Katrina, thanks for all that you do here at the museum. These collections belong to the people of Utah and the nation, and we appreciate everything that they do to ensure that the collections are well taken care of. Coming up next, my colleague and friend, Paul Michael Maxfield, will host a live Q&A with Eric and Katrina. So get your questions ready, stay tuned, and we'll see you in just a moment. Hello everybody, my name is Paul Michael Maxfield. I'm broadcasting from the Natural History Museum of Utah's Life Gallery, and I am so glad to be with you tonight. Thank you for joining us for the second of five nights of Behind the Scenes Reimagined. Now, I know that there's been some tech troubles, and I wanna give a quick shout out to our tech team that fixed them so quickly. Um, thank you for doing that, and uh, our apologies for the bumpy video streaming. We hope you're having a great time tonight and uh, we're gonna do our best to keep the party going. Um, as you know, it's vertebrates night at the museum and I am joined by NHMU mammalogist, Dr. Eric Rickard and Katrina Derrick. For the next half hour or so, Eric, Katrina and I will be taking questions from Facebook, YouTube and NHMU's website. Folks, if you've got questions about vertebrates, Eric and Katrina have answers. So send us your questions now and let's get started. Eric, Katrina, thanks for joining us. How are you tonight? Doing great. Thanks everybody for joining. Yes, welcome. I hope we can answer your questions. All right, it looks like we've, we've already got a, a, a bunch of questions here, which is really exciting. Um, let's start with Bennett, Bennett's question, Bennett in Bountiful. Bennett in Bountiful um, asks, are there any animals that are native to Utah that have gone extinct? Eric, do you want to take that question? Sure. Um, well, there are a number of Pleistocene mammals and, and earlier vertebrates like dinosaurs that have gone extinct. But if you mean any animals that have gone extinct in recent times, um, I'm, I know that among mammals, uh, there aren't any. Um, we have one species of mammal that is endemic to Utah, which means that it's entirely within the confines of the state. That's the Utah prairie dog. And it's, it's reduced its range and it is a species of special concern, but it's doing fairly well under management. And it's certainly a long way from extinction, or we hope so anyway. Um, I, I can't speak for other vertebrates. There are some other vertebrates that are uh, frogs and things of that sort that are that have very limited ranges, but um, I don't believe any of them have gone extinct. 
Are there any animals in Utah that are endangered currently? Um, <laughs> yes, but probably not severely endangered. And again, when we're talking, I can only speak to, to mammals, um, really, and, and vertebrates a little, a little less completely. Um, as I said about the Utah prairie dog, um, it's lost its, much of its historical range because of human development, but it's still intact in areas that are not being developed and it's doing quite well in those areas. But the reduction in population size that comes from reduction in, um, in land that, that these animals occupy, these and others, is one of the things that endangers species. Um, and uh, in general, we're not creating more habitat, natural habitat for animals and plants in Utah, we're only taking away from it. In some cases, we can re reestablish animals in areas that have been uh, revitalized, but, but without proper habitat, things will become endangered. That's right. Um, okay, uh, Luke in Murray wants to know how you can identify native mice versus invasive rodents. Eric? Uh, okay, I can, I can do that one too. <laughs> um, we, have, we have a few species that have been introduced into the state uh, by accident. So things like um, non-native rats and mice, the, the so-called brown rat or Norway rat, it doesn't actually come from Norway, um, is, is a species that's very, very common in the Salt Lake Valley and elsewhere. The common house mouse is another one. Um, and these are non-native pests. They look different, um, but you have to know what to look for. They have naked tails that are scaly, long naked scaly tails, whereas just about all of the native um, rodents in Utah have a lot of hair on their tails um, to a greater or lesser extent. You can't see the scales. There are only, there's only one exception to that, and that's a native species called the jumping mouse. Um, we do have some species that are native, or one species that's native to the eastern and midwestern United States, the fox squirrel, which was introduced by people um, probably about 10 years ago. And anybody who lives in Salt Lake Valley um, including up towards Bountiful now, um, is probably familiar with the fox squirrels because they're active during the day, unlike most kinds of, of small mammals. And um, they're very acrobatic and they make their presence known, both through vocalizations and through flashing through the trees and things like that. Um, they're here, they're probably here to stay and they're probably increasing I guess we would call them invasive because they really don't belong here. They don't belong west of the Rocky Mountains, but they're here and they're in other towns and cities of the West and they have been for a long time. So we have to learn to live with them as part of our urban wildlife. Now, um, are fox squirrels um, putting any pressure on uh, native squirrel populations? We still don't know the answer to that. Um, they're definitively they're um, they're in the the urban landscape. The fox squirrels are, and they do come into contact with two other squirrels that are in the urban landscape. Um, the red squirrel, which is another kind of tree squirrel that's native to Utah and much of the West, it really wouldn't be down in the city where the fox squirrels are, except we've. We've got a lot of trees down in, in downtown area, particularly conifer trees, which they like. Um, so they do come into close contact in place where, places like Liberty Park and up in the upper avenues where there are trees that are planted that attract both species. And there are some agonistic behaviors that have been some fighting and, and displacement um, that's been seen. But I, since neither of them really belong this low, this low elevation, um, it's not a matter of one replacing the other, it's a matter of both of them surviving 
in rather no novel or new habitat for them. So the jury's still out, but from what we know now, it doesn't look like the fox squirrel's displacing anybody. The other species is a ground squirrel called the rock squirrel. And they probably come into contact with, with fox squirrels much less often. Um, and again, they, they live very different lives. Uh, the rock squirrels are ground on the ground or underneath the ground and the tree squirrels are up in the trees. All right, there you have it. Um, Katrina, Tommy in Bountiful, um, who is six years old, by the way, uh, wants to know if vertebrates have shells. Well, that is a fantastic question. So some vertebrates do have shells. So um, the definition of a vertebrate just means that it has vertebrae that protect the spinal column. So that includes fish, reptiles and amphibians, mammals and birds. And so within reptiles, there are turtles, right? So turtles have shells. Um, there are also some mammals that we could consider that have shells like uh, the armadillo um, which if you're, if you're from Texas or Kansas, you know all about armadillos. You've seen them on the highway. And so they have this keratinized shell that, that they crawl up into when they are frightened. Um, so yeah, that's a great question. All right. Oh, this is an interesting question. So Lyra from Columbus, Indiana, um, recently visited Mammoth Cave in Kentucky with her family last year. And uh, there she uh, learned a lot about bats and she also learned about white nose syndrome. Um, and um, uh, she's wondering if white nose syndrome is a problem in Utah. And um, also uh, if, uh, um, if bat populations can recover from it. Eric, do you wanna take that one? Well, I'll start on it. I think Katrina may know a little bit more about it because she, she comes from a state where it's shown up. To my knowledge, it hasn't, white nose syndrome hasn't appeared in Utah yet. Um, it's probably unfortunate, it may only be a matter of time before it does. Um, if the populations of the bats that are infected are large enough, um, then there, there should be animals, or hopefully would be animals that could contract the white nose fungus and survive. And if they survive because they have characteristics, genetic characteristics that have been selected for, then strong selection will occur and the survivors will be immune. My understanding is that the white nose syndrome, syndrome um, uh, fungus comes from Eurasia. And so there are related bats in, in Europe and in Asia that have, have had this and co-evolved with this fungus and are doing, doing just fine. Um, and hopefully North American bats will also be able to get through. Not all North American bats seem to be susceptible to it, but some definitely are. And some of the populate, some of the species have very, very small populations and only a few places where they hibernate or have maternity roosts, generally in caves. And some of those may get down to the critical level of, of not being able to come back. So, that may happen, I hope not. Yeah, so while white nose hasn't been um, discovered in Utah, it has been discovered in some caves in New Mexico, which is where I'm from. And originally white nose in the US, we thought was confined to the Eastern half of the US. Um, and then I think the first place it popped up out West was, um, was in Washington. It was somewhere in the Pacific Northwest, um, presumably, came on uh, people's boots, people who'd been in caves, people who go spelunking. And so that's why it's really important to wash a lot of your gear after you're in caves, if you're gonna go travel around to different caves. Um, and so, so the way that white nose spreads, is it spreads when, um, when bats roost together in these really tight colonies. And so species that are in really massive colonies are gonna be more susceptible to it, as opposed to bats who may roost um, by themselves or in, in really small groups, like some of the tree roosting bats, like the, uh, the silver haired bat, uh, for example. And so different species could be affected differently. And then like, like Dr. Rickert said, with, the, um, with smaller populations, there's just a greater chance that a small population will get wiped out and wouldn't be able to recover. 
So you said um, uh, for those people who who just learning about white nose syndrome for the very first time, uh, you said it was a fungus. I'm guessing it uh, turns the nose of the bat white. Um, do you know uh, what happens to the bat? Like, why is it so deadly for bats? So it's not actually the fungus that kills the bat. Um, what happens is it wakes them up from hibernation prematurely. And so they typically die from hypothermia um, because then their body, their metabolism kicks on and, and starts trying to do all these things that the bat would be doing if it weren't hibernating. Um, whereas when it's hibernating, you know, it's kind of shut down and, and regulating things in that manner. And so that's, that's typically how it works. I see that. That's horrible. Um, you know, Eric, I know that uh, you've done a lot of research on bats. Um, do you mind just talking a little bit about uh, um, uh, what you're working on now? Well, all the work that I've done on, on bats has been in the context of the, the project I've been working on for several years in the Philippine Islands. Um, and even there, it sort of takes my role, takes takes more of a, an effort towards understanding the the rodents rather than the bats. But um, bats are, are, require some, some technology in order to, to understand in, in good detail. First of all, they're, they're not so easy to catch. Um, and we have ways of doing that now. We can use mist nets, which are very fine nets to catch, net, catch bats and then look at them and, and determine what they are. Um, it's also possible to record their echolocation calls. Many of many species of bats have unique echolocation calls. And in fact, in the Philippines, there've been some people doing that very thing. They've been doing surveys of bats uh, using mist netting and also using um, recording echolocation calls and looking at how the calls differ and they've actually discovered that there are new species of bats that look very similar, but have very, very different calls. So there's a hidden level of, of diversity that's only, only emerged based on what we understand about their call behavior and, and structure. Um, there have been some bats that have been thought to, well, that have been uh, under a lot of pressure from, from people in the Philippines who are harvesting them as food, particularly the big, um, the big flying fox uh, uh, groups and, and also some of the smaller members of that family, the flying fox family, we used to call them mega bats because they're bigger and they have big eyes and they use their vision rather than echolocation to navigate. Um, and, and so some of those, some of those species have, have declined in abundance, but, uh, and, and a couple of them or one of them was thought to be extinct. Uh, for a while because the only known populations had been wiped out by people collecting them as food. Um, but fortunately that particular one, another location where the bats were found to exist that was unknown prior to the extinction of the one, one area um, was discovered and now they're being protected. So uh, there's a lot of bat diversity in, in the Philippines um, much more than there is in the United States, mainly because bats are most abundant and most diverse in, in tropical climates. Uh, most of the bats we have in, in North America, well, all of them uh, are hibernators or they may migrate relatively long distances to, to get the Southern areas during the cold, cold winter months. But um, in some of those species that are in warmer areas in the Southern parts, um, are active, are active, not necessarily throughout the year, but have greater activity um, and will break hibernation naturally to go out and do things like drink water and things like that. At least that's my impression. Uh, Katrina, you have anything to add about? Uh, about bats in general? <laughs> the bats in general. Well, I guess it was, it was a specific question that Paul Michael directed towards me, so. Yeah, I'm also about, yeah, your research in the Philippines. Yeah. Great. How big is a mega bat? Well, the biggest ones have a wingspan that's, that's longer than the stretch of my arms. Wow. Uh, feet, six feet long um, and weigh, oh, at least two pounds. Um, 
a kilogram, maybe a little bit more. Um, actually, the two species of bats that that vie for the for the title of largest bat in the world. Both of them occur in the Philippines. One of them is endemic to the Philippines. It occurs only there. Um, it's the golden crown flying fox, the Ceridon jubatus. I'm sure you wanted to know its Latin name. And the other <laughs> one's more widespread. It's, it's the giant flying fox, um, Teropus uh, vampirus. Even though it's not a vampire, it's called a vampirus. One of those species is, is largest by weight and the other one is largest by wingspan. So take your pick. They're both in the Philippines. Uh, and I, I'm hoping that they, those, both those mega bats eat fruit and uh, they do. not human beings. They do, but in the old Dracula movies, or not so old Dracula movies, they would usually use a flying fox to look like a dangerous thing that Dracula turned into, where I see him and I say, oh man, those are just, wonderful bats they're just smart and they're they make wonderful pets there's lots of youtube videos of of bats particular mega bats particularly from australia um and you you fall in love with them they're just fantastic animals i love to hear that okay well we've got a question from a fellow mammologist um rob uh, joining us from facebook um uh worked on a wood rat project as an undergraduate of the California coast some 40 years ago. And he'd like to know how they're doing as a species and has the range changed much over the years? Katrina? Well, so there's about 26 different described wood rat species. Um, I'm not sure which species Rob may have worked with um, that could have been on the California coast, you said? Yeah. Um, so, so that could have been um, the white throated wood rat. They get into to Southern California. It could have been the, the big eared wood rat. Um, it's a few different ones. And and so I actually worked on on wood rats for my master's thesis. And um, as far as we know, most most wood rats have pretty healthy populations. Apart from ones that live on islands, there are a few populations of the white throated wood rat that lives um, off the coast of the, uh, the Baja Peninsula and, and island populations of any species essentially is more likely to be threatened by climate change, um, habitat alteration, things like that. Um, as for the wood rats here in Utah, they seem to have pretty healthy populations. They're just about everywhere. <laughs> I think um, Rob was asking about the dusky-footed wood rat. Ah, yes, the dusky-footed wood rat. Um, so I don't know uh, very much about the dusky-footed um, wood rat. Um, I know that um, Dr. Marjorie Matoke, she works on um, a hybrid zone between the dusky-footed wood rat and, and the big-eared wood rat. Um, she's a professor at um, University of Nevada, Reno. Um, and there's this, this narrow contact zone where they, they come together in, in the Sierra Nevadas. Um, but I, I don't know much beyond that. Um, how are wood rats impacted by climate change? Do you mind just talking a little bit more about that? Yeah, so um, there hasn't really been um, a whole lot of research about how they're currently being impacted by modern day climate change. Um, but what a lot of my research looks at is, um, is how past climate change, so throughout the Pleistocene, there were these glacial cycles forming and cooling that pushed populations around, changed the habitat. And, um, and so my research has used genetics to figure out how these populations may be related and where they may have come from, where their distributions used to be, and then comparing it to modern day distributions and so looking at those changes from past to present can give us an idea of how they might change in the future. And so there are a couple species of wood rats that um, they live on mountaintops. And so we are concerned about mountain uh, dwelling species because as the climate warms um, and we, we lose habitat, trees shift upward to, um, to maintain um, a cooler environment, environmental niche conditions 
then these animals that are adapted to montane forests, they're going to shift up in elevation too. And so once you get to the top of the mountain, there's nowhere else you can go. And you can't go to the next mountain over because you'd have to cross a basin. So, um, so that, that could be a concern. Yeah, that sounds, uh, that sounds like a really kind of tricky situation if you're a small mammal. Does it, you know, eventually there, you can only get so high. Um, okay, uh, Max in Los Angeles has a very cute question. Um, so get ready. Do rodents love each other the way humans do? <laughs> That's a great question. Do rodents love each other the way humans do? I don't know if anybody has, has really quantified it. Maybe in, in lab rodents, because we like to use lab rats to you know, study certain behaviors in, in, in psychological studies to, kind of, um, as a proxy for humans. Um, in terms of wild rodents, um, are many of them monogamous? No, there are not very many monogamous rodents. Um, I believe some species of voles and lemmings are monogamous, so they'll, ha they'll find one partner and that's their partner for life, but most rodents, they, uh, they like to keep lots of partners throughout their lives. <laughs> Eric, would you like to weigh in on that? Yeah, I, I, you're absolutely correct, uh, Katrina, when you're talking about North American rodents. There aren't very many that, that would be, but it, there's at least indirect evidence and some evidence of animals in captivity that, um, that there may be monogamous rodents, that is um, uh, male and female that, that pair bond and stay together for a long period of time. Maybe not for life the way, way some birds do, but probably so, particularly um, in places where population density is very low and it may be difficult to find a mate. And so if they're spending that much time together, they're used to one another. And as humans, we know when we stay, spend a lot of time together with each other and we get used to one another, that, that's a big component of love. So I like to think that, that many of the rats that I've studied in the Philippines that we think very, that are very docile, that we think might be um, living monogamously based on their distribution through the forest environment, um, I'd like to think that, that they love one another. That's a great answer. <laughs> <laughs> so it sounds like, just like humans, some rodents are monogamous, some are not. All right, well, Joe out in Sparta has a question about the collections. And uh, this is a, a question that uh, a lot of folks have been submitting to us. Um, they're really curious about how you organize the collection by year, by species or, or, or something else. Katrina? Yeah, so the way most natural history collections for, um, for biology um, are organized is by a taxonomic rank. And so that basically just means things that are most closely related go together. So all the rodents go together, all the primates go together, um, you know, all of the uh, lagomorphs go together, that's rabbits and hares, um, things like that. And so um, then within that, um, it gets more specific, you get families, genus, and then, and then species. And so they're organized through that rank. And so if you pull out a drawer, you're going to have all of, you know, the dusky footed wood rat, for example, it together in one drawer. And then within that drawer, it's organized by um, geographic location. And so, and, and by uh, alphabetical order. So you'd start with in the US, you know, um, Alabama, or is Alaska, Alabama, <laughs> you know, <laughs> all the way through, I guess, Wyoming, um, Vermont. Um, and then within that, it's by catalog number. So every animal, um, every specimen has a unique number. So there's a specimen here, and, and it will have this number on the tag, and then we put those in numerical order. All right, awesome. Um, we have some more collections questions. Um, uh, I know that you've already touched on like how we can build and grow our collection, um, but uh, Schuler on Facebook wants to know um, 
how you make the decision to accession something into the collection. Do you do it uh, you know, for specific projects on a regular basis? Do other researchers contribute to the collection? Eric? Oh, <laughs> it could be all of those things or both of those things. Uh, uh, specific research projects uh, that produce specimens. Many research projects are just using specimens that already exist, but many of them that involve field work involve the, the preparation of new specimens that will come in to act as voucher specimens or the spe specimens that, that form the material basis, um, the factual basis for the research that was done. Uh, we try to encourage uh, researchers who are working with wild, wild vertebrates to, to voucher them, to, to uh, deposit specimens in, in the collection. Even if they're not collecting them thems themselves, sometimes there are mortalities, trap mortalities and things of that sort, things that die accidentally. And all of those make good, good specimens. There are also uh, research projects that are uh, survey projects and very general, going to places where either um, scientists didn't do any collecting in the past, like a lot of the work in the Philippines, or uh, they haven't done it for a long time, like uh, many of the surveys that we're doing in, in the Intermountain West, going back to places that were surveyed 50 to 100 years ago, and then uh, making new collections, uh, preserving new specimens that can be compared to the older specimens to look for differences in, in any number of things, in their morphology, their size, um, their genetic structure, uh, and certainly their distribution and relative abundance in the same localities where they were found in the past. Um, so there are lots of opportunities to use museum collections and to grow them. And um, since things are always changing, because just because an animal occurred in the past in a particular place doesn't necessarily mean it's there now, or that it was absent in the past, not so now, it might be here. So, yes. Katrina, so, anything okay. to add to that? Yes. Yeah. And Go ahead, so, Katrina. So I also um, think it's important to mention that, that, um, that we don't turn away um, specimens just because it's a common species or something that doesn't seem that interesting, like the invasive house mouse. It's like, oh, who cares about a house mouse? Well, um, we can track maybe how it's moving. Um, maybe it has been here for a long time and then it's not here anymore. Why? That's an interesting question, right? Um, or the really common native mice that we get. Um, we, we take all of those in because, um, because we never know how those populations can change. Now, why is it that you guys uh, collect so many of the same type of animal? So we, we get that question a lot when you pull out drawers and drawers and drawers of the same species and making them from the same location. And it's because if you were to select a random person off the street here in Salt Lake City, they wouldn't be representative of the population here in Salt Lake City, right? And so it's the same kind of idea that one animal is not representative of a whole population and certainly not an entire species. And so we need a lot of samples and um, that becomes really important in, in one thing, just as an example, like disease screening, is you need a lot of specimens for disease screening. Um, if you're gonna test you know, 100 specimens, you might only have one that's positive for a disease similar to, to the current pandemic, COVID-19. You need a lot of testing to actually figure out how prevalent the disease is in our population, right? And what the risk is of it spreading it's the same thing in tracking it in animal populations, which is a really important component to tracking diseases also in humans, since we know um, a lot of diseases that humans get can come from wild animals. Well, that's really interesting. Uh, Augie uh, here in Utah um, wants to know why you put stuffing in the collection specimens instead of just leaving their insides in. Katrina, do you want to, uh, do you mind, Katrina, do you mind holding up the specimen that you were, I think it was a wood rat that you, yeah, and then show people. Yeah, so, so this is a wood rat skin. So it is stuffed with cotton, as, um, as Ty Burrell pointed out, right? And it's 
so the reason that that we take the innards out is we first take out the um, internal organs and take a sample and put it in a little tube like this, take a tissue sample, and that can be used for extracting DNA or screening for diseases, things like that. And then we take out the rest of the body, so um, the skeleton, because we also will study the skeleton and we will um, put that skeleton in with uh, dermestids, which are flesh-eating beetles, and it cleans off all the flesh from the skeleton, and then we scrub it with a little toothbrush and and we have it clean. And so then we also have the skeleton. So this is the skull for this rat. And so then we can look at the skin, look at all the characters, the color of the fur, the length of the fur, how long the foot is, things like that. Um, but then we can also look at the skull for interesting characters that are um, unique to the species maybe. And, and we keep the, the other parts of the skeleton as well. So, yeah. Awesome, okay. Raina um, over in Sugar House wants to know, are there any particular species or specimens not currently represented in NHMU's collection that you would like to see added in years ahead? Yes, I'll, I'll answer that. Um, there are certainly things that are underrepresented um, in U the, the uh, species that occur in Utah. Um, and some of that has to do with species just barely get into a certain part of the state and, and we haven't yet uh, caught any or, or had any uh, delivered to us to accession. Um, and then there are things that are just, that were under surveyed in the past. Uh, I mentioned bats, the fact that we have new technology now that's really only come into place since the 1960s using mist nets and using uh, and back detectors to listen into their echolocation. Um, and in the old days, it was very, we didn't have those things. So bats could be examined and collected at their roosting sites or shot out of the air with a shotgun, hunted essentially. Um, but then you wouldn't be able to shoot at things that were flying at really late at night when there wasn't any, any light. Um, so it was more haphazard the way we acquired specimens of bats. So it's important, particularly now um, with, with the um, white nose syndrome, we don't have very many legacy specimens, that is older specimens of bats that can tell us things about the nature of the species and the nature of their populations, their, stru their genetic structure and things of that sort. And it's important to understand those kinds of things before the, the epidemic of white nose arrives. Um, unfortunately, right now, it's, it's, it's very hard to do any kind of field work, and particularly on bats, because of COVID-19. And we know that, that COVID-19 uh, came from, a, from a, a bat in China, um, or at least there's strong evidence that's the most logical host for, for COVID, and showed up in a market. Um, in, in China. And um, we wouldn't want anybody <clears throat> transmitting COVID-19 that was ill to, to a bat presently. So most um, departments of wildlife have, have put a halt to research on bats. Uh, at least I know they've done that in Utah until we get through this pandemic. We don't want to be infecting our native bats with with something that might be even more virulent and, vi and, and destructive to the bat populations than it is to the humans. Um, but we need those samples. And so hopefully we'll be able to, to get them um, and do what we can to, to build the, the genetic resources and the tissue resources that we, we, can, we need in order to look for things like um, parasites and pathogens that, that may be in these, in these animals. So yes, there's still a lot that needs to be collected and a lot that needs to be, to be studied. So to, to kind of add on to that, something that, that we don't have a whole lot of represented in our collection that, that we'd like to grow is a collection of parasites. And so, you know. <laughs> well, hold on a second. Did you just say you'd like to grow a collection of parasites? Yes, I would absolutely love to collect. <laughs> absolutely. 
So a lot of these these animals that we collect, they they have ectoparasites like fleas and ticks and mites, and then endoparasites like uh, tapeworms, for example. And so um, these parasites tell really important stories about the biology of the animal, but but also their own biology, because there are parasitologists that want to study them. And a lot of times what happens is you have a mammologist who's only interested in the mammal and then tosses the parasites, so it doesn't matter. Or you have a parasitologist who goes out and catches these animals and gets the parasites and throws the mammal away. And so we're, we're trying to move away from, from that sort of self-serving research um, to having what we call the extended specimen, which is a specimen with all of these different parts, so different data types like field notes and um, GPS coordinates, but then having different tissue types for genomic research, and then also parasites, which are their own animals with their own biology, um, but they are part of this, this host, and, and we want to be able to associate them because you can learn things about either one um, when you have them together. That's really interesting. You know, I, I never uh, really thought about parasites being so important uh, for museums and for science. Um, you, John in Salt Lake wants to know if there are stories from your specific research area that you'd like to tell in a museum exhibit, but just haven't told yet. There are lots of stories that we have. <clears throat> um that that come from our research efforts that uh that come from the specimens that we have and yeah we could go on i mean i could pick up um an individual mammal specimen and talk about it for an hour both in terms of where it came from how it was accessioned why it was accession interesting facts about its natural history and biology um i wish we could do that for everything if you look hard enough, you find out why these things are all unique and why the study of them is so wonderful and so so satisfying for those of us who do it. Um, so yeah, the answer is yes, but we, we have been able to, you know, to give small um, vignettes on, on work that we've done. Not so long ago, they did one on the shrews that, that we've been surveying in, in the Intermountain West and new records of them. Uh, new species of shrews that have been found in Utah. Shrews are tiny little insectivores. They're smaller than mice. And they, they, they turn out to be one of the most fascinating groups for finding out new distributional records and finding out more about how they live and where they live. And so this has been very exciting. Every time we catch one, it's, it's an excitement. What about you, Katrina? Are there any stories that uh, that uh, you are just dying to tell about uh, something that you're working on? Um, about what I'm working on, not uh, not necessarily, not specifically. I mean, something that that I'm really passionate about, which I probably have hinted at, is these common boring species, and so I like to see them highlighted more, like our you know, our wood rat here, just a pest to a lot of people. They, you know, want to set traps and get rid of them. They don't want them messing around in their shed. And so I think, I think telling the story of, um, of the animals that nobody would really think are interesting. Um, they would deer mice is another really common one. So I think that that's really interesting. Excellent. Um, Jeremy in Salt Lake City uh, uh, noticed that in the Thai video um, that there was a turtle in a jar filled with alcohol. And uh, Jeremy is wondering how long will that turtle stay preserved? As long as the alcohol is maintained and it's not, um, it doesn't, it's not allowed to dry out or something like that. If it was well prepared to begin with, it could last decades, if not centuries. We have, um, there are fluid preserved specimens that Charles Darwin collected during the voyage of the Beagle um, in, the, in the early 19th century, first half of the 19th century. And they're still in pretty good shape now. Particularly the, the specimens, fluid preserved specimens that have been made the last few years, or not the last few years, but the last several decades, 
they've been um, embalmed by injecting them with formalin. And, and um, that preserves them very well. And then they're, they're stored in alcohol. Um, so it's one of the best ways to preserve things. And going back to that question that one of our uh, viewers had about how we prepare them that, that Katrina uh, answered, we do take specimens of mammals and, and, and routinely um, reptiles and amphibians and preserve them whole. So all of their body parts are preserved, but it requires, you know, developing the chemicals that can, that can act as effective preservatives because otherwise they'll just rot. And it took a long time for scientists and natural scientists, naturalists to, to understand the techniques to prepare a specimen so it could be preserved as a specimen in a collection and be used properly. And we're still developing those things. So the, the fact that we flash freeze specimens or parts of specimens in liquid nitrogen means that everything is there from their last meal to the parasites and the, the pathogens that they might be infected with, which is why in terms of medicine and understanding where, where things, um, where some of these novel diseases have come from, museums have proved invaluable, their tissue collections of, of frozen, uh, frozen tissues. So I went right. far afield with that, I think. No, that's uh, that's really interesting. It's uh, quite a scene. If any, if uh, anybody has a chance, uh, next year's behind the scenes, you know, to check out the wet collections. There are so many amazing specimens uh, in jars uh, full of alcohol, and it, it's really interesting to see this this technique. It feels like a kind of almost like a timeless technique to uh, suspend um, animals um, for. For a long time, and it sounds like you know perhaps for forever. Is that is that right, Eric? Well, forever is a long time, <laughs> but, <laughs> but certainly, certainly yes. I mean, extending it well beyond the lifetime of the of the collector, and in seemingly unaltered state in many cases. But um, but we try to do we try to increase the number of preparation types that we have, and as Katrina said collect as much information from, from not only the host, but also the parasites. We're mammalogists, but we're also trying to be producing things that are valuable to parasitologists and disease ecologists. And, and our whole job here as museum scientists is to increase the scope of our collection and the scope of the uses that our collections can be put to. Yeah, it makes, makes good sense. Uh, Angela in San Francisco uh, is curious about the rules, regulations, and ethics that surround collecting specimens. Great question, Angela. Katrina, do you want to take that? Yeah, so, um, so to collect specimens, you have to have a permit um, that would be with some government agency. Um, that and it, there may be restrictions on the permit, like there's certain species you can't collect, like endangered species, for example, or protected species, um, or you may only be able to take a certain number. The rest of them you have to let them go. Um, and and the ethics that's that's an interesting question, and that's and that's something that we take really seriously. Is what is the ethics behind removing this animal from its environment, and and the way we see it the research potential from these specimens um, will, will help us to understand these animals much better and then um, be able to put out research that protects them. That's right, is one of the ultimate goals. And also um, the, the number of specimens that we're typically taking is a very small subsample of an animal's population. If you consider that one owl might consume a, um, three, three rodents in a night, you know, one owl, if that's every night of that owl's life compared to us going out for a weekend and trapping mice, um, we don't make a dent in these populations. Um, but it is something that we think about if we're sampling a population that we think may be really small, um, then then we know that we wouldn't want to take too many of them. And then again, that's where government agencies become really important is they regulate that kind of thing um, so that people aren't just going out and wiping them out entirely. 
So when, before you go on a collecting trip, then you uh, often have to apply for permits. Is that correct? Yeah, so, so not just for collecting, but also um, we have to have permits for receiving um, specimens into our collection. And then we also have um, animal handling protocols as well. So best practices for handling animals in the field, um, things like that. Millie uh, um, from Salt Lake uh, has a question for you, Eric. Um, Millie is wondering, during your career at NHMU, how has the science of vertebrate zoology changed or not changed? Well, it's changed a lot. It changes every year. Uh, I've, been, I've been at the Natural History Museum longer than anybody else here. I was hired in, in uh, uh, gosh, I think 1985, 1986. Um, and at that time, our collections were a lot smaller. They hadn't been curated properly for a long period of time. Um, and I'm happy to say that, that over the years, we've done a pretty good job of increasing the quality of the, of the um, uh, collection environment. Uh, moving into this new building we're in now is, is, was a great step forward. The old building was very elegant, very cool building, uh, built in the 30s, but it was, didn't have climate control. So we're able to take care of our collections and we've been growing them successfully. We've also been increasing the efficiency of our, of our associated data, uh, digitizing in the early days, our, our catalogs, and now digitizing images when we can, field notes, um, all sorts of things. Um, so we're constantly trying to strive to improve those things and, and grow our collections in ways that make them more useful in order to meet the changing needs of, of research scientists. Um, when I first started out, there was very little use, or I should say limited use of, of genetic resources or tissue resources for genetic work. Um, a lot of it was limited to what institutions had frozen tissues because people, this was before people were sequencing genes, they were looking at proteins um, through electrophoresis and gene products, essentially, and looking for variety that way and interpreting genetic um, variation that way. Um, and now we're, we're at the point where, you know, where we can do all sorts of genetic work and that I don't understand, but, um, but we want to have the resources that make it possible uh, for people to do that sort of thing going forward. One of the big challenges is trying to anticipate the directions in which things go. And we can't do that fully, but the better job we do of, of, of collecting everything, the holistic specimen, uh, increasing the, the number of parts, the, number, the amount of information that's with it, the variety of, of preservation techniques, all of those things go to increasing the value and put us in a good place to maintain that, that importance of, of, the, of the resource for a variety of expanding uses. Interesting, okay. Um, looks like we have time for just two more questions. Uh, so let's go with uh, uh, Austin's question. Austin is from San Diego and he wants to know what is the smallest rodent either living or extinct? Oh, good question. Um, the smallest rodent, I'm not too sure. Do you know, Eric? Hmm. I'm not. There are lots of things that would vie for that, uh, that in, in, among the rodents. The smallest rodents, I think, in, in Utah are harvest mice. That's but what then I there, think. there are also some very, very small pocket mice, but I don't think they're as small as harvest mice. And in, oh gosh, in, in Asia, well, the one I'm familiar with in the Philippines, um, there aren't very many really tiny mammals. In fact, there aren't any really tiny mammals. Even the shrews are larger than the shrews that we have. And the rodents on average are quite a bit larger as well. Um, yeah, it's hard to say. And in terms of things that have gone extinct, we don't know yet because uh, micro paleontology, looking for the very, very small things is still a very difficult thing to do. 
and they're um, and we're getting a lot more information about about very tiny things. But unfortunately, most of the paleontological history, the fossil history of of mammals, is in the realm of teeth, isolated teeth. Um, and although there's a lot of information there, oftentimes we don't know very much about, about other aspects of the anatomy. We can infer it in some cases, but, um, but there are a lot of really cool things that are being discovered um, that are small. Um, so nah, can't answer that part, of the, that part of that question. At least I can't. So when we're talking about a, a small mammal, you said like a harvest mouse or a pocket mouse, how small is that? Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> smaller than a mustache. Is that what you're telling us, Eric? Smaller, smaller than yours, definitely. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> <laughs> Not maybe mine, no. Um, pretty small, just a couple inches long, less than two inches long body length and in a tail um, by weight maybe only five grams, very, very small. It certainly, but the thing, everything starts out small. Even a blue whale starts out small um, when, you know, it's just post-fertilization. So I guess it's sort of interesting at the other end too, but, but uh, yeah, no, I, I'm not trying to trivialize the question. It's a really good one. Um, I can't answer it. All right. Um... Mark, okay, this is going to be our last question, and this is going to be uh, for both of you. Um, was wondering about the first biological field expedition that you guys joined, and um, uh, Mark wants to know kind of what you were studying, and and to hear a little bit about the story of that very your very first uh, um, uh, field work. Oh. Uh, Katrina, do you want to get us started? Sure. So my first experience in the field was um, when I was doing my bachelor's degree at the University of New Mexico, and I took a mammalogy course. And a requirement for the course was to go out in the field and trap mammals and prepare specimens. And you have a, a small collection of, of study skins that were ones you, you prepared. And the very first trip I went on, it was... Um, up in the mixed conifer mountains in September. It was very cold. Um, it hailed and set off all of our traps, but we still caught way more animals than we knew what to do with. And um, and after that, I was, I was in love with it. I knew this is what I wanted to do. Um, I found my, my path in biology. I'm gonna be a mammologist. I wanna prepare museum specimens and catch animals forever. And so that was, that was my first time in the field um, ever. But my first time in the field for my research was kind of a um, like a, a renaissance experience for, uh, for my passion in this field because it was really interesting. Um, I was catching wood rats, targeting the habitat, and then, and then catching the animals and, and just making these notes about like, okay, now I know this is where I would find these and really getting to understand the species that I study um, and so that was a really great experience. And most of my fieldwork experience has been in um, New Mexico, I should add, but I'm really excited to get more experiences here in Utah. All right, thank you. Eric, tell us about your first experience in the field. Okay, this will have to be a two-parter. Because <laughs> you've I'll, got a lot of experience. I'll follow, I'll follow Katrina's lead in this um, and tell you about my first one. Um, I was 13 years old and the guy who lived, the kid who was my friend who lived next door to me was a, about a year and a half older than me. Um, and his father was a biologist. And when I found that out, I was really, I was really intrigued because he had a little collection. My friend did. And, um, and his father had big collections at, at the university where he worked. And he said, I'm going to go out. My friend said, I'm going to go out and I'm going to trap some mice. You want to come with me? And I said, sure. And we went out and we, we caught some mice in the neighborhood woodlot and brought them back. And we had, I think, three kinds. There were two rodents and there was this 
animal called a shrew. And I didn't, I didn't know what a shrew was. And so my friend told me what he knew. And, and pretty soon I realized that collecting stamps and coins and stuff like that was okay. But all that stuff was artificial stuff. And there'd be much more interest in, 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 in studying um, specimens of wildlife, of mammals in particular. Um, this is when I was 13. By the time I was 14, I knew that I wanted to be a mammalogist and two, that I wanted to work in a museum. I'm a mammalogist and I work in a museum and I'm 70 years old. <laughs> Okay, the other, if we still have time for it, the other two-parter, the most memorable thing was my second trip to the Philippines. And we were working on an isolated volcano, um, dormant volcano in southern Luzon, actually in one of the areas that was just hit by a big typhoon um, a couple of weeks ago or a week ago. And we, there had been some work done on this on this mountain in the 1960s. This was in the 1980s when I was there, and um, so we knew that there were there were a few kinds of things that were present, and we weren't catching any of them, and uh, we were not baiting our traps correctly. We we caught by accident uh, an animal that didn't look like any of the other things we've been collecting with coconut and peanut butter bait. And it was alive, it was alive in, a, in a live trap. And we just started feeding it some things. And somebody picked up an earthworm and gave it to this rat. And it just slurped it up like it was spaghetti. And we realized that, that there were, this animal clearly ate worms. So we caught a bunch of worms, the light was fading and we set a few traps out right around where our camp was. And the next day we had three of the things that we had caught alive that first night by accident and two others that looked entirely different. And they turned out to be a new species, a species new to science that no, nobody had seen before. Um, and it was the first thing that I was involved in describing scientifically as a new species. And it's still my favorite mammal. Well, there you have it from wood rats to worms. Um, <laughs> Eric and Katrina, thank you so much for joining us. Um, really appreciate your time tonight. And thanks to all of you for tuning in. Be sure to join us tomorrow night at 7 p.m. as Ty and Jason take us into the herbarium and uh, show us the botany and mycology collections. If you haven't already, be sure to explore Behind the Scenes Reimagined on our website. There you'll find photo galleries and stories and videos and even these really cool 3D models that you can kind of spin around. All those things showcasing um, NHMU scientists, collections, and research um, that goes on behind the scenes at the Natural History Museum of Utah. Have a great night. We'll see you tomorrow. And remember, stay curious. Bye, everybody. Bye.